Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is February 11th, uh, 2015. And as I was saying in the uh, pre-show chatter, uh, you know, I, maybe you've seen some headlines and people have marked six months after Michael Brown's death. Um, it, it's just uh, the time that for us to kind of come back and check in, see where we are in terms of our response as educators to that event and to all the grand jury stuff and, and other issues. Um, we'll see where this goes, um, but, the, but that, that's a very open invitation to have uh, all of you talk about this. Uh, and I want to, and, and where you think maybe your your students are, and, and what we might do as a community to c address some of the issues. And, and as part of that introduction, Al, would you mind? Do you even remember toward the end of uh, one of the last times we had this conversation? You were talking about beating a dead horse. Um, and <laughs> meaning that, like, focusing on this issue so, fo you know, constantly um, right. maybe was, was getting a little counterproductive. I, I'm putting words in your mouth there. But can you kind of uh, start us there and tell us what you were thinking then? And then we'll, do, then we'll get some introductions. I just want to get a flavor of the, of the thinking I think uh, ultimately, first, uh, good afternoon. Can can everybody hear me? Okay. Yeah, we yeah. can hear you. Great. Okay. All right. Fifth grade um, teacher in Alabama. Yes, fifth grade teacher who, who Alabama, uh, very close to Birmingham. I think ultimately, um, I think the point that I was trying to make at the, at the end of the other uh, hangout uh, was that like sometimes it feels like we're beating a dead horse when we talk about this topic, like to almost to agnosium. Uh, and I was—I think I said something to the effect of, you know, I don't mean to beat a dead horse, but it seems like sometimes this horse won't die. Um, something to that effect. Um, but I—but I think ultimately, though, like when we talk about like issues like Black Lives Matter or uh, anything surrounding it, I, I just think it's important to to think about it in the historical context. In, in that, like in in this country specifically, the, there's never been a period of time. Uh, where there weren't issues like the issues we're talking about, uh, specifically talking about, um, I guess, you know, police brutality spe specifically. Um, there, 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 there have always been pockets of, you know, minorities that, that seem to get, you know, the short end of the stick um, when, it, when it comes to treatment in, with, uh, you know, police or justice systems or, or laws or, you know, just anything to, to that effect and just kind of outside of just specific police brutality I mean I, I just think that it's important to just you know, realize that we have arrived at a destination like we are here where we are now because of things that have happened you know in the past in, in how laws were created how laws were enforced uh, and, and all of that so you know I guess ultimately it's like we don't have to be talking about race to be talking about the effects of it. You know, right. like, we don't have to say this is a Black Lives Matter conversation if we were just talking about almost any problem, especially if it has to do with education or the performance of certain groups of people in educational institutions. Um, and I, I think that's kind of where I was going with it, I think. No, I think that's, a, if you don't mind, a, a, a nice frame to connect us um, in some way. Uh, do we let's uh, let's go around quickly and get introductions. Chris, do you want to go next? Am I the only Chris on here tonight? You That's are. Cool. I don't know. All right. I don't know why. <laughs> somebody, <laughs> somebody, somebody put the somebody broadcast. Put the broadcast on. On. Chris, you must have it on. Oh, maybe. Um, Just Chris cool. Rogers cool. in um, Philadelphia Media and Technology, and. Um, yeah, glad to be here, and um, glad to sort of get into more. Um, so ever since this thing started at my job, I don't know if you remember, Paul, my job's been really, uh, or my school that I work at, has been really interested in the race conversation. And I'm, I'm just like you, Al, of like race. Y'all just want to stop at race. There's a lot of things going on in this world right now. And when we talk about like justice, I'm talking about justice. I don't want to talk about race. And... Um, 
So, like, having that little thing has been sort of fun. And glad to be here to sort of, like, get these sort of, like, um, vent and kind of get these ideas out and continue to build with people across um, different sectors and spaces across the country. So I think you still have it on, though. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. So, oh, so it's still, like, that, figure that out. Figure that out. Yeah. Yeah. Mute. Oh, yeah. 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 Then join us back. Then join us back. Good. Right. Dwayne. Dwayne. Welcome. Introduce yourself, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. Dwayne, are you there? There you go. Okay. Some parts are echoing. Yeah, but I think it, it's off now, though. Go ahead. You're good. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I teach. I'm from Oklahoma State University Writing Project, and but I teach at Tulsa Community College. And so most of the work that I do within the college and working and dealing with issues of race relate to my work uh, for African American students. I work with the African American male group and the African American student organization. I'm the advisor for the student organization. So we spend a lot of time uh, dealing with you know, feeling connected to the college, feeling connected in the community, but also just dealing with the issues that happen in the, in the national So a lot of times the students are disturbed by the issues and they want to know, what do I do? And so that has been, obviously over the last year, it has been a recurring theme of how do I respond to this in a way that's not destructive, in a way that is positive, in a way that actually changes? Cool. So let's go, kind of go quickly. Uh, Janae, welcome. Hi. Um, my name is Janae Williams, and I am a high school gifted resource teacher and coordinator of gifted services at um, high school in Stafford, Virginia. Um, I also teach service learning. Um, I work a lot with the LGBTQ um, community um, at my school. And um, I'm in an area where um, if you say the word black, everyone cringes. So that's kind of indicative of uh, the climate of uh, my school and in a broader context, the county um, and the state um, as it pertains to um, dialogues on um, race and the uh, the greater implications of, of race on a lot of what happens um, in our education, our process of education in the state. So um, yeah, I've become a lot more involved recently um, in addressing an issue with one of our counties in the area regarding their disproportionate uh, disciplinary essentially the school to prison pipeline uh, in one of the counties and it's very clear with uh, the statistics of um, referrals and expulsions and things like that 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 is an issue that must be addressed so that's me well, welcome thank you Joe Joe Dill welcome Mr. Hey, Tequity <laughs> so I'm Joe and I'm from the Denver Writing Project and I work just a stone's throw away from Denver in Aurora which is a large urban suburb of Denver and because I'm the because I work in educational technology I'm interested in you know, how technology of course you know serves to increase equity in schools and you know fosters better lives and opportunities for everybody um, one of the one of the things that sparked my thinking was a, an important blog post a while back by Nicole Mira, who was writing about the LA iPad rollout, was saying that, you know, as LA was kind of struggling with that, what the media was doing was they kept cranking out stories about how these darn students were hacking the iPads and doing all this, you know, basically how the students were at fault for kind of a poor iPad rollout. And so, I mean, I, the issue pales in comparison to things like Ferguson, et cetera, right? But the idea that, you know, we can often sort of say these darn kids when we have problems with our own, with the changes we're trying to bring about in schools. And we can also start to, you know, classify students' behaviors and get them in trouble for new and more exciting things with technology. And so, you know, I started a hashtag called Techwity, along with some other writing project folks, just to think about how, you know, how do we make sure that, you know, when we're trying to change classrooms, you know, 
we're doing it not for the devices and we're not necessarily doing it for the teachers. We're doing it for the purposes of equity and to, you know, and to strengthen a system that needs strengthening. So I'm glad to be joining this conversation because in a lot of these types of conversations, I want to be a learner and get smarter all the time. Cool. Welcome. Thank you for coming by. Joe, nice to see you. <laughs> okay, sorry for my voice, you guys. Um, Joe Buddy, so I teach in 12th grade, deep east Oakland, California. Um, I guess my tie to all of it is I have two teenage boys of my own, uh, a daughter and another son along the way. So I have a very personal connection to issues of race and just because that my kids are every shade of the rainbow. Uh, but I also have a lot of uh, young black men and young black women and brown men and brown women uh, for the last I don't know, 13 years or so that I've been teaching. And I guess I don't I want to throw it on the table uh, in response to I think what Chris was saying about or Al. I'm not sure which one said it. Um, about how we're beating a dead horse. Um, you know, in Oakland, we're facing a lot of charterization of our high schools. And I don't know if we want to, if we can take the conversation there briefly at some point or in a future TTT. Well, we got um, Philadelphia going on here, too. So. Okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> where. Uh, and New Orleans, too. But go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. It's, yeah. It's, a, it's a different kind it's of. It's an epidemic. Yeah. It's an epidemic. Yeah. So just a different kind of beating we're taking. Um, I mean, it's a given our boys get shot and our boys get killed on the streets, but I mean, they're just, they're getting pushed out of the safe spaces now, even though our school is where it's at. Um, so we're in a really deep fight right now, uh, which is why I haven't been on the TTTs for a while. It's because we're really engaged in a battle with our district about all of the privatization. So, but I'm happy to be here. Yeah, you know what, I, I think being able to talk about those issues and, and just think about how race impacts on them is exactly what I was talking about. I think. Yeah. So, yeah, great. Um, can I also say that one of the times that we were trying to get students on, you had, there was a, 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 a death or a killing in your school, and, and you, you know, that, that was so present for them that it was hard for them to, to yeah. focus on these other issues. Yeah, they couldn't, they just... It was too close to home, uh, and at the same time, they were so jaded. It was It's this weird, funky dichotomy we're facing that they're so, they're so used to it, and then, uh, but they didn't want to talk about it to the world. So. I think a lot of times, just to kind of... Yeah, somebody has the broadcast on. Let me see. Dwayne, do you have it on? Oh. You want to, yeah, just listen yeah, just through here through and not have the broadcast on. Uh, I have the other one. I have, uh, oh, did I turn it off? You did. We're good now. Thank you. Oh, no. I, I, but, but I guess I, I was just saying, like, a lot of times uh, uh, when you do talk about it and about it, when, you, when it falls on either deaf ears or when you have to spend so much time trying to convince somebody that what you're talking about actually exists, like it, it, it just becomes exhausting, right? This, it's like I've, I, it's, like I've spoken to Ignazium about all of this for years, and it's like every time you have to convince somebody that you're not overreacting or angry. And I'm, I'm 42, so I can imagine to be 17 and that be your reality. And for everything else that you know you're not to understand, to hear once again, uh, well, we've got a black president or, you know, uh, we, we, we've made all these strides or whatever. And then at the end of the day, you know, we're, we're still having the same conversation with our kids that our grandparents are having with our parents. It's, it's, it's just a very frustrating place to be. So a lot of times I identify with the younger people that genuinely don't want to talk about it because it's, it's, it's like, why almost right? Mm -hmm. Valerie, get in here and introduce yourself, and then you can keep interrupting. <laughs> Hi, I'm Valerie Burton from New Orleans, Louisiana, and um, you got any charter schools down there? 
Oh, that's ha 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 ha. ha. Um, I teach um, English four and AP Lit, and yeah, we've we've got a lot of charter schools. But you're not in New Orleans, actually, right? You're you're just south. Right, of I'm so. just outside of New Orleans in Harvey, Louisiana, on the West Bank. So, so is do most of the kids in Harvey go to public public schools, or I know that. Don't yeah. charter um, schools. Right, I can't say most. I can't in in the in that area there are that's a really good question. We've got maybe three, four, four public schools and three charter schools in the area. You do. Yeah. Um, and our public schools, you know, they're routed by geographical location, whatnot. But um, if they wanted to go to a charter school twenty miles the way they could. Oh really? You know? yeah. Well, it's I didn't okay. mean I didn't mean to jump your introduction with just addressing that. Um, what That's else did okay. you have on your mind as you're joining? You, it's been a while, so it's nice to see you. It has, it has. I've had. It's really funny. I've had technical issues, which really drives me crazy. You know, I, I try to be the, the tech queen and goddess, and I can't get my internet at my house to work. It's just there. <laughs> um, but you know. Black Kids Matter. I have black kids. I teach black kids. I try to train and guide black kids. Um, and I, I guess technically we cannot stop having these conversations because we keep having the problems, you know. And for me, as I look at the, um, the belligerence and the lack of respect for authority and a lot of what I see on a daily basis in the classroom. I try to make sure that they understand. I'm I'm scared for you in the streets. Wow. You know you can't you can't act like this. You can't do this. You can't say this. You can't. You know. So the conversations really do have to continue to be to be had because the conditions are still the same. You know, 50 years, 100, 150, 200 years later. Anyway, that's it. Thank you. You're welcome. Dwayne, um, can you unmute and and make sure that you can join us? Yes, no, but Dwayne, it seems like you have on another screen somewhere the broadcast playing. And you want to turn the broadcast off, you can find that. Okay, that's a good question then. Well, uh, yeah, see, it's well, well, I can try. Are you on? Are are you somewhere? Are you on edtechtalk.com/dtt? And then that may be playing there, or somewhere. Well, so mute, mute yourself and then work on that, and then okay. we'll help you. Okay, I just want to jump that jump that in. So, uh, where are we? Who? What do we want to talk about? I so and and I'll, so I'll I'll kind of one thought. I had a recent conversation. Where somebody in the staff room said, um, and you'll get the point of this in a second, that that a, a principal was being unfair, and it turned out that she was African American, um, and somebody said that she's racist, right? And um, the uh, um, African American members of the staff looked up and said, "No, she's not. She's black." Right, <laughs> and the white members of the staff said, "Wait a second, right?" You know, and so, but you know, you can't you be racist and black, um, and so so that but and so here's the point of that really the point of that story is that I brought up well you know racism has to do with power so this is complicated because that principle does have some power um, but but you can't talk about you know. It's not just prejudice. There's power attached to it too, and the white member of the staff, and this is my point, um, said, you know, acted like she had never heard that before, and so we spent most of the rest of that conversation kind of educating her about racism and power and and how that all works, and it felt a little frustrating to me to be educating her. So I'm wondering if I'm wondering if that that need to educate people like I just want to say you want just go to Wikipedia and figure it out <laughs> like why do we have to educate you too often I think our race conversations stay on that level 
that that was well, kind I of think a long kind of just, story, but yeah, go ahead. <laughs> not, not, we're, we're just kind of talking on, on that point. I I think that's kind of the danger of anything that that is umbrellaed under black anything, right? Because first, like, I had to define what what you know, I guess, a Eurocentric approach to anything was. Right, and that's not white black. That's just a Eurocentric approach to me is to find something that you deem valuable, a resource. Simultaneously ignore the culture that already exists and possesses that resource. Figure out how to mine that resource while establishing your own culture. Okay, and so that could be from how anybody came over here to the Europeans to how you can look at the value of hip hop music. And, and, and do the exact same thing. Like, wait a minute, there's something valuable there. We can make money from it. Ignore the culture that exists. Uh, and then how can we establish our own? And then you start to get away from black and white. You just start to look at a certain behavior. I think racism is like that. If if in your brain or in your mind that there are, there are certain characteristics that are undesirable and most of these undesirable characteristics are housed within a people of a certain shade or hue then it's very easy to, to just treat them all one way right um, and, and it's not necessarily black or white you know if 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 I have gone to a majority institution for you know X number of years and and I've been trained uh, you know in, in, in a certain way to handle certain problems it, it almost you know doesn't matter if you're black, white, green, red, whatever. Uh, you you are conditioned to handle certain issues a, a certain way, and and you know it, it it almost doesn't matter if if you're just following you know instructions or following the conditioning that that you've been subjected to. So I I, I think that's kind of the, the nuance of a lot of this that that gets ignored if you're looking at a black face doing anything right. We just get caught up into where this is a black person, and so they can't be racist, or they can't be prejudiced, or they can't, you know, marginalize a certain group. Mm -hmm. Chris, you're leaning forward for a reason, or? For a reason or? Oh no, oh, um, yeah, I think um, Al brings up a um, awesome point of I think a lot of the times. Um, for me, always, I'm trying to move to a space where instead of saying people, I say the system. And I'm uh, and trying to move to more uh, understandings of, I'm not talking about one person. I'm talking about the system. And I think Al, when, when he talks about the, the behaviors and the ways that things are operating, he's looking at it from like a, a system perspective. And I'm trying to bring more people up to that level of um, let's not focus on the individual Sort of, because for me, like like I was saying earlier, like a lot of those individual things that happen are just reminders that we live in a system which creates these things inevitably. So it's like, let's talk more about the system and bringing people to talk about the system. And that's where the education point comes in. Because people, um, you can really get caught up in sort of like these interpersonal um, interactions and have like, um, like for example, my, my school has been particularly set upon the um, the self-esteem issue of internalized racism. And I feel like solving the self-esteem issue of internalized racism has no uh, applicability to being anti-racist. Um, so, like, trying to sort of maneuver that conversation has been an interesting one for me. And sort of a question... Um, that Can I'm you turn that around? Turn around. Oops, we are Oops, echoing. We are we echoing. Um, um, <laughs> can we turn that around turn in, it a around in a positive way? Like, what, do you mean? what do you mean? It has no... It has no I think by... Like, um, negative um, negative. Negative. Oh, yeah. Um, by the... the focus on, for me, focusing on um, sort of like the internalized racism or maybe a child who is dealing with, you know, stereotype threat does not get at how we like take part in a system every day working the behaviors from like charter school privatization which is in all these sort of like um, overarching actions that create the opportunities for where a child who is in a public school is all automatically looked like as a sort of like 
loser in a sense from like there's if if it's and this is from the school choice argument if his parents cared enough they would do more to get that child out of that public school that's the argument that this school choice thing is making so it's like I'd rather focus on those sort of arguments than rather always be sort of stuck in how do you feel about racism how does racism make you feel I feel like how, how does racism make you feel doesn't get to the ways in which the economy and the, the ways in which America is built like um, on a capital side of Racist behavior. I think I have a I have comment a about comment the racism. I think I think can't call. It depends on how you define race racism before you can say that a black person is or is not racist. And the way I have always looked at the issue is, if you are benefiting from societal consistencies of the the race aspect and you are perpetuating it by uh, taking advantage of it and saying I am benefiting because I'm on the other side and I'm better than others because of my race or lack thereof then you can be called a racist. If you are a victim of racism and also don't like other race, including your race, you are not a racist, you are a victim of racism. And so it's more of a dramatic viewing of how you view yourself. So you aren't racist, you just happen to be a victim. And I think those that's different than being called a racist. A racist is one who actually gets, is privileged because of their race. And they continue to perpetuate that privilege by not acknowledging or not trying to change that way of thinking. Twain, uh, when you introduced yourself, you talked about working with, uh, was I think it was young men, but um, who don't feel connected on the campus. Can you describe that a little more? Like, what do you mean by not connected? I think well, you said that, because, right? yeah, well, it, Part of the, uh, my work is to connect them or help them be connected. And I work with both the African American males specifically and with the African American students overall. So we actually work with the males because nationally and with all of the research, that is the group of students who have the lowest persistence rate. So one of the things that we try to do is if we can help them persist and be successful and be connected, if we can figure out how to create that connection and that engagement and that success, we know that we can also create that success in other students as well. So it's really the theory that goes back to you. Know, these are the canaries in the mine, the coal mine. And they are the ones who are going to die off first, or they're the ones who are going to have the Muslims socially. The okay, when you simply when you all, there. Like, Dwayne, we, lo here. we lost you right at the Canaries. Sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, they're they're the Canaries in the mine, in the coal mine. And they're going to have the, the problems first. They're going to have the most problems. And so we try to work with how to help them solve their problems. And then we can also work with other students to help them solve their problems. Because they'll have fewer. The other students will have fewer problems, typically, in, in general, than, than the African-American males. Because the African-American males will have the social layers they'll have the financial layers, they'll have the self-esteem layers, they will have multiple layers of problems that they have to overcome in order to be successful. It's not just poverty, it's not just gender, it's not just race, it's all of those lumped together and it becomes a, a stone for each layer of problems and it's difficult for them to carry that and so we try to help them overcome those barriers uh, knowing that other students have barriers that are similar, but they just don't have as many. 
others jump in here too, but I, I want to – the um, – so you're you're seeing these young people in in college. It's a it's a community college. Did you say? I think yeah. It is a community college. Um, yes. And so when we when we talk in K through twelve and sec secondary schools, especially about kids being college ready, what do you wish we did with kids to get them ready for college? Well, no, that's an issue that goes beyond race, but it, from a from what I encounter with the students I have, many of them are shocked that they have to that they have to work mm -hmm. beyond what happens in school. So they come to the classroom, and you know, a conversation I had on Tuesday was, okay. I've, I've shown up for class and you expect me to do homework outside of class as well. And so I said, well, yes, you're going to have to do some homework and then you come to class and you're ready. And the student's response was, I do not have to do homework outside of class. And I said, well, my job is not to give you time in class to do the work. My job is to help give you a framework for the, the work that you're doing and to help you understand what you need to do and to support you in your learning. And the student really struggled and is struggling with how do I perform? How do I succeed in school? And so I said, okay, you don't have time. And she kept, this was a female student in this case, and she kept saying, I do not have time. So I said, well, this is what I would like for you to do. Because I, you know, the simple response would have been, well, you're not ready for college because, well, actually, she's not. <laughs> but my response to her is to say, I want you to come back to the next class, and I want you to be prepared to have a discussion with me about your time. And so we need to talk about what you can do, and you need to be thinking about, is there, are, is there an hour? Is there, are there two hours anywhere in your day, even though I know you're working one job, probably two jobs, and she actually did say she's working two jobs. Mm -hmm. So the students need to have a realistic perspective of when I am doing something, particularly college, that is a job that is beyond the classroom. And mm -hmm. so a lot of times what we do in high school, because I, you know, I do work in the high schools in terms of uh, volunteer work, I, and I, so I see and I work with teachers. I know a lot of times we let them do the homework during class and they also need to have this perspective that all work, all learning is never going to occur for college just in the classroom. It, uh, it actually occurs outside of the classroom and in the real world even for a career, all work is not going to occur between 8 to 5. I would love to believe that all work were 8 to 5 but it's not that way. So that would be my, that's my suggestion, but <laughs> that's a good start. That's a good that's start. One. Yeah, that's one. Others want to jump Others in. Others want to jump in here. Yeah, I, th I think that's a really interesting example, uh, Dwayne, of because um, when I, when I, when you when you tell me that story, the, the first the thing I, I go and think about is um, is that he or she is working um, two jobs and is trying to uh, go to school. Eventually, to like work on a, I guess, like a, a longer sort of like career idea. And when I think about education, I think about how we prepare students and how, um, for me, how disconnected, you know, our our teaching and the the content that we teach is from sort of like those real life functions of like, yes, um, I, maybe I don't know how old she is, but like, um. I'm, I'm saying she. I just imagine this is she. He said and, it was a she. It's a she. Okay, cool. And how um, education is sort of disconnected from the functions of making it in this world. And how that creates that sort of thing of like, yo, I really don't have time for this because this is not what feeds me. This is not what's going to create my livelihood, this schooling. So it's like that disconnect between um, sort of like learning and education for me. I think that's really evident in your example. And um, 
and I, I definitely feel like that is uh, something that we all have um, a lot of work to do from like higher ed and K to 12 of like making education relevant for life. A phrase, a phrase I just picked up from an article a while back about the post-traditional learner, right? The idea that like schools are designed for the student who has two parents, you know, who are putting food on the table, and they're also the kids put them and you know go to college, kind of, kind of the way we all wish we could, and that you know. Those schools are actually only only educating a fraction of those, those students. That's only a reality for a small fraction. We kind of, from a systems level, we still think that's who we're we're educating. So we, you know, we demand that you know, kids try to graduate in four years from college, even though they're, they might be carrying two years of or two jobs or whatever. The idea that we're there's a mismatch between the student we we think we're serving and the student we often are serving. I think those support needs there, and I think that you know, probably. Dovetails with race. You talk about risk factors for a black male who's a little bit behind in high school, and you know, yeah, is when somebody is a little bit behind in high school and they're experiencing some, you know, they're experiencing some of the trials that can come with being in a tough neighborhood, etc. I mean, I think often it's not like the, the plate hasn't been set for you as a teacher. Like the idea that you have a you have an interesting challenge in front of you, and the chance and the idea that you're supporting human beings and you're trying to educate them and trying to keep them moving, but I, I mean, I appreciate the systems conversation because, you know, sometimes we stubbornly insist that if you know if these kids would all go out and find like two parents and you know <laughs> shore up the neighborhood they have to walk through to get through school, it'd be easier on us as teachers. And I think, I mean, I, I think you know, how do we make sure that we're always supporting the students who are in front of us with what they need from us? Especially at times when they come into school, trying to process what they see in the news, and some teachers wish on those days they didn't have to talk about race. That's what that was making me think. I'm just trying not to hog the conversation, but I can't help but to think like, okay, so like one of the things like when teaching like the Native American unit. The thing that always boggles my mind is how old the artifacts were, right? Like you've got like 10,000 year BC artifacts of a people, and 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 to me it's kind of like that was a sustainable culture for like 10,000 plus years, right? And then I think about society that we have today, and in 10,000 years I don't think we're going to be anything like what we're like now. And and one of the things that makes me think about is if you go back to an ancient culture, they never learned anything without purpose. Like, when they learned how to skin a buffalo, it was for a reason. It wasn't just skinning buffalo, right? When they learned how to build a teepee or how to fish or how to make pottery, it started with, okay, we need to catch water and get it from here to there. It became art. It became something that served a different purpose. And it, it just kind of ultimately makes me think of, uh, I, I know it's not a DeSecchi's ad, a commercial, but the most interesting man in the world said in one of his ads, Find out what you don't do well and then don't do that thing, right? Like, we got to stop lying to kids. College ain't for everybody, right, in, in a very real sense. Like, we got to stop pretending that if you get a degree, the heavens will open up and life will be okay, right? Like, I got friends with PhDs struggling, <laughs> you know? It's, it's not necessarily the degree. It's, it's, it's the purpose associated with whatever it is you're doing. Right. And and so figuring out, OK, I'm doing something and I need to figure out how to be well at whatever that something is. And if it's not, you know, quadratic equations, if it's not making sure all my subject and verbs agree, is is something that has, you know, a, a real purpose. And I think that is kind of the disconnect, because most of the times if I teach fifth grade, I've taught sixth grade, I've, I've tutored middle and high school. But most of the time, by the time I run into a kid or any of us run into a kid, they've been struggling for a long time and they know what they're bad at. And they know if they work super, super duper hard and get a C, they're competing against A students and A plus students. And so at every level, they know the reality and they can't help but feel like it's a bunch of adults lying to them. You know, like, okay, all you got to do is study real hard and you work really hard and, and, and then, you know, the, the truth is unemployment is never zero. Like it ain't enough jobs. 
It never has been, never will be. So we need to figure out how to, you know, add to the education piece. Hey, listen, with the tools that you have and in, in the landscape that you find yourself, here is how you make sure that you don't die. You know, and, and, and that's not necessarily part of the curriculum, but I think, you know, it, it ought to be. So let me just um, call out uh, Valerie and Joe, who uh, right before we started this, um, were excited to find out that both of them are teaching Hamlet. Um, <laughs> so how are you how are you teaching Hamlet with purpose? Because I totally trust that I can ask you that question <laughs> and get an answer. <laughs> <coughs> Valerie, you want to start or I'll go? Well, I'll start just because I'll end with you who's actually teaching Hamlet and I'm prepping to teach Hamlet. Fair enough. Um, so for me, I tell them that I love the way Shakespeare manipulates the language. So I let them know that um, he's entertaining, it's a big poem, it's, it's all of this. And then we proceed to go into the work itself. Now, we all know that they're not going to quote Hamlet or Romeo or Juliet or anything two years from now, five years from now, six years from now. If, you know, if they go to college, yes, it might be a light bulb that goes off for them. But for me, I think it's really important that they understand language and what we can do with the language. You know, how we can persuade people to do something, make them feel a certain way, how we can portray the way the world is. And I think that um, some of Shakespeare's works are really, really good at doing that. I took them, had an opportunity to take them to see A Midsummer Night's Dream actually performed, and they laughed when they were supposed to. They laughed when they weren't supposed to, but they loved it and they in, they enjoyed that, the experience. And then afterwards, you know, they came back and they were like, "Okay, this is like really stupid young love young love stuff." And I said, "Well, what do you mean? Well, one guy loves this one, and another one loves this one, and all of a sudden they they cast this spell." I said, "Wait, so are you saying that Shakespeare has something to do, something reflected in your life?" And they're like, no, "Well, not my life." But see, my girlfriend, my girlfriend likes this boy. <laughs> so, you know, we have the opportunity to get them to appreciate the language and then to see that if you, you know, if you pay attention to the themes and the main ideas and the ideas within the piece, that, you know, these things happen. Again, it's the same thing. We're beating the same dead horse. You know, we're telling the same story, and there's a reason that we tell that story. You know, it's a good story. You can learn from the story. There are values within the story. There are life lessons within the story. So whenever I do Shakespeare, I, I do it from, you know, that angle. But my first thing is the language. Appreciate the language. No, you're not going to understand all of the language, you know, but appreciate it. So we act out stuff. You know, I give them uh, some scenes, and they act it out, and then we read it, and then we watch a little bit. So that's how I generally handle Shakespeare. Thank you. May may I insert something Go, there? Yes, please. I actually, yeah. I actually think that what you are doing is something, whether they go to college or not, I think they will come back to that lesson, that story, because it is a human message. It is a message. And if they understood it in your classroom, they're going to understand it because it's going to play out in their lives, their children's lives, their friends' lives, get over and they're going to say, what? This has been something on high school, and I'm seeing it happen again. And this is what I think when I look at getting to the race aspects. This is where when they see the race universal messages of this is when how we are abusing each other as it relates to race. This is how we are perpetuating problems because race. If they can see that in the language, if they can see that in their experiences, they're also going to see the mistakes and then they can try to prevent those mistakes. So culture to me allow, opens that conversation and makes it seem objective 
how can we apply that? And so I think it there, and I think it's going to matter in college, and I think it's going to matter in career and other avenues other than college. Joe and then Janae, I want to know what you're thinking, but <laughs> um, well, I teach Hamlet to my AP kids, and we take it to a, a different tip. The language, for sure. I mean, I tell all my students, like Shakespeare's the original gangster, in terms of like mastering the metaphor. He's the original, so there, you know, there's all this language that we got where he created it. Okay, there's that. But my AP students, this comes after they've done "Cry the Beloved Country" and things fall apart. And a lot of that was about father-son relationships. A lot of my kids don't have fathers. So uh, on kind of like an Oedipal tip, we take it to that psychological level. And they then it takes it, it's beyond race. It, it's, it's, it's now down to a human-to-human -human relationship. With my Othello kiddos, we just finished Native Son. And so the question they asked, well, one of the questions was, we just read this play, I mean, we just read this story, Miss, about... You know, black man kills white girl. And now we're reading another story from 400 years ago, black man kills white girl. And, and it's interesting because I feel like <laughs> if we had done it in reverse, I wouldn't have gotten them hooked on it. But now they, they're going to see this character of Othello where, you know, that we're looking at themes. And so it's, we're looking at manipulation. And we're looking at how in Native Son it was manipulation. And then to speak to the systemic part, you know, they're looking at manipulation by the system. So what happens in Native Son when Bigger Thomas' his whole life and his whole, all of his decision making is really and truly affected by the system in which he's growing up. That was real for them because in light of Ferguson, in light of our kiddos getting shot um, in the fall, that was real. And now they're studying Othello and it's, you know, now they see Othello, they see this character who's a warrior, who himself gets manipulated by a system, and he truly is in the minority, and what happens. So race, I mean, skin color in terms of, I guess, xenophobia, we look at that theme, is it's handled differently. And how they look at the language and how the kids uh, look at the references, I don't know, in some ways, I mean, they actually get mad again. Like, I want to say that they, they're jaded a lot by what's going on all around them. But the fact that the fact that Shakespeare wrote about this such a long time ago, and the references he's using, and the villain turns out to be the white guy, um, it's really interesting. I mean, I'm getting all kinds of different reactions from the kids. We're only, like, intact ones so far. So stay tuned, but... You, I, in a quick email the other day, you mentioned that you were going to try to use genius related yeah. to, to, to Hamlet, was it, or, or not? To both, Hamlet and to Othello, yeah. Okay. So the, the, both those plays are on genius, I think? Yeah. Probably they are. Probably. And they can annotate it. And, and what would be fascinating is if, I mean, one of the wonderful things about genius is that you could you can be annotating Shakespeare and then look over and find glory, right, <laughs> or, or another song or whatever. And, yep. and then, yeah, so so that's that's really an interesting possibility there around yep. that. Yeah. Janae, what have you been thinking? <laughs> Um, so I, since we started, I, I've been yeah. thinking about um, what Al said about beating this dead horse, right? <laughs> um, and, like, first, always as a teacher of color in the school, in the classroom, there's sort of, like, this, like, subconscious shame around dialogues around race because it's just, like, do I really have to relive this victimization that I is part of my lived experience? Like, do I have to do this in my classroom um, for a bunch of students that may get it or may completely not get it at all? Um, and then, like, I think also the idea of beating the dead horse comes from the fact that if we really want to talk about the issue of what I 
in spaces that I feel like it's can, it's productive to use it, I try to use the word as often as possible, white supremacy as opposed to racism, um, to really get to the heart of the issue. Um, how can I really get to the heart of the issue without sounding like a conspiracy theorist? Um, because that's really hard. If you really dig in deep and, and talk about the history of white supremacy and how it built so many, so much of what we do in, in our laws and everything that is, um, you end up kind of sounding like a conspiracy theorist. And in that vein of thinking that way, um, do do people let you use? I the think word? we try to. I'm sorry. Do, do generally do do people let you say white supremacy and talk about that perspective? What I happens? I don't there? use that in my classroom. No. Yeah. We, but I mean, we use the word racism. Okay. Go ahead. I, I didn't um, mean to interrupt. Yeah. Um. So I think that that feeling of beating the dead horse is like we try to slip it in when it's relevant. I mean piecemeal it because it's really hard to have the full conversation um, and in that like when you get an opportunity to talk about race when race is relevant culturally or whatever in the media um, it's typically already we're typically already inundated with it and it's just again beating that horse and then also one thing that I'm finding um, and I'll shut up in a second um, so I think there's a sort of way that we have taught students to have difficult conversations. Um, and I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but I'm realizing that as I have dialogues about race in my um, classroom, it's a thing that I'm approached that that's coming up more and more. But this idea that when we're having difficult conversations, like Chris was talking about earlier, we sort of set them up around, how do you feel about this issue? How do you feel about this issue? What are your thoughts on this? Um, so when we get to conversations where, and all honestly, some, in all honesty, some people just need to sit back and learn um, and take in information and do that and, and really sit with that, um, people come to the table with this false equivalence of like my opinion of your lived experiences experience is equal to your actual lived experience, um, and that's not a great place to start a dialogue about racism and white supremacy, honestly, um, because then you end up you know having this discussion of well who gets to decide what constitutes what is racist. And I, I don't, yeah. So I don't know, maybe, I think my questions are, uh, how do we set up dialogues um, around racism and white supremacy that um, really get to and, and focus on the fact that your opinion on someone's lived experience is not equivalent to the, what their lived experience is? Um, or is that even something that I should be talking about? And also, um, to my first point, kind of maybe really, really delving into what the kids, what is relevant with kids right now? And I mean, I sound like I'm a geezer, but <laughs> um, how we can sort of infuse whatever kids are taking in via social media, whatever's happening. Um, like uh, Kylie Jenner just got dreadlocks. Like that's an awesome opportunity to talk about cultural appropriation um, right there. Um, maybe really just getting into what kids are seeing on social media and seeing those opportunities to have these dialogues. Mm -hmm. Thanks for all that. I, you and Chris are planning, or I think you're still planning, a conference um, around race forward kinds of thinking, um, meaning institutional and systematic ways of looking at the question. Do you, do you, can the two of you talk a little more about what you hope to do at that conference or what you hope to accomplish or what you're dreaming about at this point? So I'll start and Chris okay. can go with it because I literally just talked all of the words. Um, uh, so one big thing uh, that I love that we definitely see eye to eye on is um, we do not want this to be race 101, um, racism 101. Uh, 
it's not productive if we're looking for moving towards actionable steps and, and really looking at what uh, racial justice looks like in a classroom. Um, we don't have the time to talk about why you have privilege. We don't have time to talk about, you know, what racism is. Um, really getting to um, what racial justice looks like in a classroom. And I'll just stop there. Chris, you can take it. Um, yeah, I, I, for me, the thing I've been reading this week, um, somebody, somebody, some teacher in my PD said the word margins. And immediately I was like, oh, snap. I forgot to read that Bell Hooks Radical Margins piece. So in um, the radical margins, what she's talking about is really um, creating uh, spaces that are, that are sort of like um, at the margins. It becomes like a site of resistance, a site of possibility. And really with this conference, what we're trying to do is really focus on what does it mean for people who like have a commitment to being on the margins and being able to sort of like create this racial justice space. And, and be able to work together to really grow some um, actionable steps and that steps beyond sort of like these, like you were saying earlier, Paul, about these education conversation of like educating people on issues. But what happens when you really bring a, um, folks together to talk about, all right, now we're going to get into doing and, and uh, committing and then sharing this work. Um, so... It's like a one-day thing, trying to bring a lot of folks together and really get toward get get more towards connecting this sort of like um, like the everyday pieces that Janae was just talking about with Kylie Jenner, and say, well, how do you how do you take that and then go to cultural appropriation and then go from cultural cultural appropriation to white supremacy, and how do you make those connections in a way that is understandable for students? And um, I think in a, in a lot of our sort of like conversations and dialogues about sort of like racial justice, we don't have a space to be able to do that because we're always trying to make sure everyone need, understands that we need to be there. So trying to really create this like space on the margins, where we can really commit to like creating. I think like one I of the tools, one of the that, tools I, that I kind of use, kind of use um, uh, with, with having those discussions with, with, with my students that are, that are so young is that I just try to humanize whoever we're talking about, especially in history, and I let them make their minds up. Like I don't call George Washington a racist or a terrorist or anything like that. I just let them know, hey, he owned slaves and so did a lot of other presidents. I mean, and, and, the, and the kids make up their own decisions or just accuracy in when you're first presenting anything. Like, you know, George Washington does not start with chopping down a cherry tree in my class. That's, that's, that's not the beginning. You know what I mean? And so a lot of times just accurately presenting whatever it is. And the kids are, are surprisingly just aware of, you know, the totality of people, meaning that they know themselves they're not all good or all bad. They may have accomplished some good things, and then, you know, they may have stole a cookie, right? And so they're, they're, they're just not defined by, you know, a civil rights act that was signed, or they're not defined by, you know, this just one moment in time. And I think that's kind of the most dangerous. The way to not be seen as a conspiracy theorist, and let me just address that, is to have conversation with people that know the truth. Other than that, there is no way to not seem like, a conspiracy theorist. And I just want to go on record and say I really appreciate Paul for consistently having these very, very difficult conversations as an older white guy who on the outside <laughs> looked like he might not get it. No, like sincerely, because I think ultimately that's what has to happen. And and, and my like my new mantra, instead of trying to convince people to think like me, I'm just trying to find the people that I already do. And and I and I think that's kind of what what what, what I've been after. Like, I, I used to spend a lot of time just, hey, you need to think this. Nah, -uh, mm -mm. it's a lot of people that know something's not right and they're willing to listen to people that have a perspective different than what they already think is not quite right. Well, I'm going to try to wrap up here just to respect our time a little bit. Dwayne, do you have any final thoughts here tonight? I do. Good. One of the things that I heard about the margins, as I was looking, Listful examples that we shared tonight, I heard this idea of we need to 
teach students or work with students so that they can see outside and find a space for themselves outside the margins or, or make a space for themselves in the margins where they are. But, you know, we're trying to move them to that inner circle. They are part of the, the world and they are the world. And I'm thinking that another thing I would add for what I said earlier that I would like for the students to have when they get to college is if they were questioning, questioning things, why are things the way they are? When you're in the margins, you should be asking, why am I in the margins? What is, what's left out of Shakespeare? When I hear Shakespeare continually being lost, held out, lauded as this is the, the premier writer, I need to be asking the question as a student, and I need the students to be continually saying, why is he perpetuating the Elizabethan language that is part of the cultural part of it's that's the racist. And so Shakespeare, a great writer, he is great, but part of his grace and in that language is the embedded part of racism. And if we're not asking the questions about why is he held up, we're also what we should also be wondering who are the other people? who were great but just not put in history as a greater and why would they not have been because they didn't speak the language that was cultural norm the race culture culture norm so I would say ask questions and that would work for dealing with some of the race issues Joe do you have which anything Joe? to add oh sorry yeah which Joe <laughs> Joe Dillon Thank you. Joe with an E. Yeah, go the ahead. thing I would add is that you know, as I talk to some of the black educators here, and I hear also echoed in the conversation tonight, I hear people saying, you know, that they're weary of conversations with about race, especially when it seems like you have to explain this is kind of how the system works, right? The idea that when it pops up on the news, we're suddenly having to just sort of like, you know, talk about something that is probably just the water we swim in. Right, and so though it might seem like news because it's on the headlines this week, it doesn't go away for, for so many of us, and, and that can get weary. I think that how do we plan towards action steps is is I think where I want to work with students is where I I think there's energy too. The idea that I like this idea of not trying to convert people who are resistant to being converted, but the idea that you know. Somebody who's college ready maybe is also ready to take a step in terms of agency and it's a step in terms of working together to change the world. And so I, that's how I sort of process the being weary versus like how do we move to action steps versus like versus explaining like oh hey institutional racism just get used to it you'll be seeing you'll be reading more about this. So, Joe or Valerie, do you have anything to add? <laughs> Please. Do if you do. I don't mean to rush you, but no, you're good. <laughs> Val, you have any final thoughts here? I love you guys. Y'all are awesome. Mm -hmm. It's um, it's always a wonderful opportunity to be able to talk to some de dedicated educators on any topic, and um, I think we we have the conversations that we have whether they're charter school or whether they're Black Lives Matter or whether they're to do Shakespeare or not to do Shakespeare because they're important topics and subjects that need to be discussed. So again, Paul, I've missed you dearly. I have. And I thank you for giving us the opportunity to have a discussion, whatever the discussion is. Um, because when, you know, you know, when great educators come together and have a discussion, we make awesome things happen. Very cool. Um, listen, um, I I uh, I wanted to just mention one one very quick thing. And that th there's this there's this very weird memory I have of, of childhood when you were talking about fifth grade that comes to mind every once in a while, which is that like when I was in elementary school, I was taught the cotton gin was what made America great. Right, and I'm like, oh my God, what what was left out of that story? Um, so whenever I wonder, you know, is this stuff worth talking about? For some reason, that piece of biography in me 
um, reminds me of how much is is not being told um, when you know in the history. Um, in two weeks, I, I want to mention here right at the end and and give you you all an assignment. Uh, Renee Watson, who has done some amazing writing around curriculum. Uh, 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 bringing some of these issues into the classroom is also a writer. And she's going to be on as a writer um, in two weeks, as an author. And she's written a young adult novel called um, This Side of Home. Um, and I'm reading it. I'm like uh, a few, uh, several chapters in, and I'm loving it so far. Her name is Renee Watson, W-A-T-S-O-N. And she'll be here in two weeks to talk about her book, so you get you have a couple weeks to read it and join us then if you'd like. We're here every Wednesday um, to um, talk about these issues and more. Um, we've been doing it for a while. Um, we are on the EdTech Talk channel of the World Bridges Network that Dave Cormier and Jeff Lebo set up. Um, thank you all for this conversation tonight, and we'll talk to you soon. Good night. Thanks a lot. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Good night, Paul. Bye. Bye. Bye.